Bricks and Wood pretty much took off around 2018. I went to Coachella that year. I remember I'm walking out the door of my grandmother's house. A package comes, and it's this new beanie colors that I just got from Bricks and Wood. And I'm like, like they didn't come out the way I thought they would come out. I was like, you know what? I'm going to take them to Coachella, and I'm going to just pass them out for free. So I go to Coachella. I'm wearing a beanie. Some guy walks by me. He's like, yo, nice beanie. I'm like, oh, thank you. And then I'm like, I like turn my neck and just kind of keep watching the show. I'm like, wait, oh, I got beans in my backpack. I'm like, yo. I called a dude like, yo, 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 I got some, I actually got something for you. And I give him a beanie. He's like, oh, bro, thank you. I appreciate it. I'm like, yeah, of course, bro. Easy. Long story short, throughout the night, I get a couple more compliments and I pass them to a couple of different people. Sunday or Monday comes, I'm getting DMs, people texting me and stuff. They're like, yo, like, is Tyler Crater wearing your beanie? And I'm like, what? Look at the picture. I'm like, damn, that's definitely the beanies that I had passed out. He was wearing it in like selfies he was taking and he was wearing it on the FaceTime call with Solange. Like, he was just really rocking it. And he was rocking it like days and days and weeks after that too. The rest was history. I think it's the most important staying true to yourself when you design and when you're creating because you can never satisfy everybody. So the longer and the more work and the, and the more attention you put on satisfying other people, you'll be playing catch up and you'll be, you'll be chasing something that you'll never be able to fulfill because there's people who like bricks and wood, there's people who don't. And that's totally fine, but guess what? I like it, <laughs> my friends like it, my family like it, some people in my community like it, people who work for me like it, I can give less. <laughs> bricks and wood was always streetwear. Um, it was just a different take on it for me. Uh, I think because I come up in streetwear, I would never like disrespect the history and the, 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 the university of streetwear <laughs> because I wouldn't know one thing about a fashion brand if streetwear wasn't my like liaison. I don't care what level where Bricks and Wood goes, but streetwear will always be applied to like the, the category and the narrative of like what, what Bricks and Wood is. We just try to do it in an elevated way. I read a quote that said, I'm from South Central, I'm never afraid of What did you mean by that? <laughs> I know exactly where that quote came from too. Exactly what it says, honestly, you know, being from South Central, you, you can't be afraid of anything like, and I mean anything, you know, when you grow up around guns and violence and, you know, poverty and homelessness and all type of crazy, I feel like the world kind of like, puts these things in front of you to make you be in fear. But when you can overcome those things, it's like fear is becomes, you become numb to what fear is. I've been scared. I've seen a gun. I've seen somebody, you know, get shot at. You know, I've seen those things. So it's like the level of things that actually scared me compared to what the rest of the world has to offer is like, I can't really tell you much that I'm afraid of these days. So it's like, I, I refuse to, to take myself from trying something. If I can get through that, I can get through anything. I was born and raised in South Central Los Angeles in a neighborhood called Baldwin Hills. Um, we like to call it the jungles for a plethora of reasons. It was, uh, one, it was very scenic of like trees and like those like palm trees kind of like filled the blocks up, but also it was a very uh, wild experience at times. You know, I grew up around a bunch of gang activity. So, you know, they, they literally ran the streets sometimes. So, you know, if you're outside playing as a kid and like, you know, street lights start to come on, it's time to go in the house, it's time to get in your gate, trying to like get in your apartment, you know, you can kind of stay safe because, you know, at any moment anything can happen. And I think when you talk about LA and South Central LA in particularly, these are things that you have to kind of like highlight, you know, whether you want to or not, because if not, you would just be like doing a disservice to what the reality is. My mom and dad weren't actually together uh, growing up. So I didn't have like that very like family oriented vibe. I got my dad's side, he thought he saw life one way. My mom's side is a little more traditional. A little more about a book, you know, go to school, get a job, the whole nine. But my dad being someone who traveled the world and did things in music and danced and being a stylist, him able to like instill that in me growing up, he kind of gave me a path of like, you know, just being being free to a certain degree, kind of finding out who I am. My dad was a stylist growing up. He styled for people like Biggie Smalls and Aaron Carter. I think, you know, him kind of bringing fashion to my life from that lens really helped me 
develop, you know, things that I start to like. And that's where I got into like streetwear and like those type of things. Cause prior to fashion at whatsoever, I was strictly just into like basketball. You know, that's like the only thing I knew. That was the only thing I loved at the time. But my dad kind of like created this like subconscious plan B for me when basketball didn't work out. I played in high school up until my senior year. I uh, had a bad injury, and then I realized, like, you know what? I should probably start working on, like, the next plan, which is where fashion came into came into play. I would say this was about 2010 or 11. I think I got my first gig on, on a stylist level when I was, like, 17. My mentor, Josh Willis, uh, who at the time worked for uh, Creative Recreation, and I had not, like, I actually, the funny part is, I actually didn't come on as a stylist. I came on as, like, a PA. I think he just wanted me to just get the experience. And so I would start off just running, get coffee and helping with lighting setups and just whatever they needed help on. And so the shoes started running a little, a little longer than expected. So towards the end, they were like, yo, we need somebody to pick some looks. They're like, yo, Casey, go pick some looks real quick. And mind you, again, not knowing what I was doing, not having any experience in the styling world, not having any sense of like how clothes need to fit on a model, any of those type of things. I just used my intuition and start putting stuff together. And those looks end up being like the main and the only looks to use in the in the full campaign. So like from that point forward, I kept being hired on as a stylist. They were like, yo, like you're pretty good at this. Like, you know, again, no technical skills whatsoever, but just all intuition. I think that was like my first like foot in the door with the uh, fashion and just like, you know, understanding like, dang, this is where I really want to be because I feel like my intuition kind of led me here. And I feel like you have to kind of listen to those intuitions at times. So I worked for a lot of different like companies. I worked for Creative Rec. I used to work for like the hundreds. I worked for Hall of Fame, Black Scales. I've had uh, a pretty balanced resume of working in fashion. During the, my time at these at, in these positions, I was like, you know what? I kind of took mental note of the things. I'm like, if I have my own, this is how I would run it. This is how I would talk to my clients. This is how I talk to my employees, my staff. This is how I would run things, how I would do things, how things would look. I kind of start to kind of like mentally put this like world together, this foundation together in my head. So that's really how it grew. I had another brand before Bricks and Wood called Let Us Pray. It was very uh, Fear of God like in a, in a sense. This was before Fear of God actually was even a brand. But, you know, I realized that over time when I was working on it, I'm like, I need something that has a little bit more longevity and that stood the test of time. So I went to my phone. I was like, you know what, let me just like think of some other names to come up with. And Bricks and Wood was actually one of them. This is 2015. Fast forward, I'm with my, my dad, we're in the car, we're at the airport waiting for my uncle to uh, land. He was like, yeah, the other day it was raining and I, uh, I found this leaf and it had this cool texture on it. And I just, he was like, I thought about this brand idea of like using this, this leaf or using like nature as like the foundation of a brand through like textures and textiles and those type of things. He was like, I'm a little too old to do anything with it, but um, you know, maybe you can take that and run with it and see what you got. Funny enough, I was like, yo, the other day I just wrote this name down for a brand and I told him it was called Bricks and Wood. He was like, he literally said, that's hard. And as soon as he said that was hard, that's the only validation I ever needed to know that Bricks and Wood was going to be the name of my brand from that day forward. It's been that. And the rest was history, pretty much. The me behind Bricks and Wood for me is the foundation to start from the bottom and building, building to the top, you know. This room we're in right now is literally built off of brick and wood. A lot of uh, foundations and buildings that last for hundreds and hundreds of years are built off the same elements. So for me, it's just making sure that you root it from a true space and, um, you know, and also bringing that balance of, you know, needing those two elements to create a foundation. Yeah, cool. I got lucky because I got a dad and I got a best friend. Yeah. 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 Yep. Wow. Yes. Yes. I was really inspired by like people like my dad, my mentor, Josh, my mentor, Umi, I think all these people, we might not know them on the grand scheme of things, but these are all people who gave me something. Like Umi worked at the 100 store uh, on Rosewood for seven years. And then he went on to like start his own brand. During that time of him working on Rosewood, like he was an open book. You know, he gave me every tool that I ever needed. I think even subconsciously he was giving me game without even knowing it. Seeing all these guys on an intimate level where I can like actually call them or text them and or go see them, you know, and they can like really share information with me. 
That's all I really needed at the time. I didn't really have like a crazy resume of like resources and research that I was doing. Like I was lucky enough to have like intimate connections with people who were doing it and doing it at a high level. I probably had $300 in my bank account when I started uh, Bricks and Wood. Pretty much what I did was I took my one of my checks and split that in half to use strictly for production. And I was just trying everything, snapback hats, leather coasters, beanies, and all these things had minimal to no branding on it. Because again, I want the product to speak for itself. In 2018, Tyler Critter having taken selfies with it on and on FaceTime with Solange and the whole nine, I'm like, how the hell did Tyler get this damn beanie? Like, when I was like, wait, my friend Alan is best friends with Steve Lacey. And Steve Lacey works with Tyler on music and they, you know, they're they're close. So I'm like, it has to be Alan. So I get in contact with Alan and I'm like, bro, like, did you give like did you give Tyler that beanie? He was like, bro, I didn't even give it to him. He said, what happened was he had it on. They was having a group conversation. Tyler noticed a beanie hanging in my back pocket. He was like, yo, what beanie is that? And he was like, oh, it's the homie, blah, blah. It's his brand. He was like, all right, cool, I'm taking it. And just took it out of his back pocket and just took it. You know, he liked it so much that he actually ended up wearing the same beanie on the cover of uh, GQ. Uh, he styled himself in the photo shoot. Thankfully, without even contacting me, they actually put bricks and wood and the correct price point and everything from there led to like Anderson Pack and me working very closely with him for about a year and some change and doing custom headwear for him and for his shows and for his music videos and all those type of things. And, you know, after you get that like first like surge, you kind of want to like feed the beast, right? So you kind of just keep going. And I think for me, I just kind of made sure that I was, um, you know, turning bricks and wood into like an operation rather than just like a passion project. You know, I think that's what sparked it all. So we started making apparel probably consistently, I would say 2019. Traditionally, screen printing was like the, the huge thing uh, for starting your brand. But for me, I wanted to like use a higher quality t-shirt. I wanted to use like a higher quality process with embroidery because it felt like for me, embroidery lasted a little bit longer. You know, of course, you know, over time, screens start to break and those type of things. So me going the embroidery route was me looking into the future of like, okay, how long can this shirt last with embroidery? We did about a good year and some change of just strictly embroidery from hoodies, t-shirts, sweatpants, whatever you could think of. We was and you know, we were just making sure that it was all embroidery. And I let those things kind of buzz. And then over time I started to kind of like make more branded products. You know, we lost a creative like Virgil, right? And I think it sucks because it takes someone like that to depart from us for us to understand his value, right? And I've had my opinions about Virgil, you know? I, and I definitely regret those things. I think I think it was very like emotional and immature for me, but I stand by my opinions, I stand by my thoughts, and I stand by the times that they were in, but I definitely think that, you know, as a human being now, I don't resonate with how I went about it. So, you know, when I think about streetwear, Especially going to the Virgil show the day, the day before the show, Virgil, you know, had passed away. So it was a very emotional experience for even myself, someone, you know, who, again, I might not have been the biggest fan of everything he ever did, but I, one thing that you can ask any of my peers is that I respected the hell out of his process. I respected how he did everything. After going to the show, I think streetwear is, is going to be very uh, collaborative with intention, where it shows that like you can be on the top of the world of streetwear and fashion, but still love and support everything that's under you. The humility that Virgil had, I think, was the most, one of the most inspiring things about him. You know, Virgil created this world within his brand and within his like, his name alone, created this, this, this current state of where streetwear is today, where it's not just graphic tees, you know? Like streetwear is high fashion, streetwear is runway. When I saw that runway, they had Stevie Williams and Kareem Campbell, who are OG black skateboarders with skate decks on the on the runway. You know, he had Air Force Ones on there with Louis Vuitton print all over him. Last time I checked, that was from my community, how we grew up, you know? So I give all credit to Virgil for that, creating a space for people like myself to like a Jerry Lorenzo or Tremaine 
and creating a space for people like them and like us to like be not only respected, but respected, invited, and comfortable within these spaces and effective. I think Streetwear is about to open up some doors that Virgil um, worked hard for us to walk through. I pride myself on letting the world know that Bricks and Wood is a South Central company. For me, it's just about <clears throat> setting up an infrastructure and a platform with Bricks and Wood and then being able to bring it right back home when it's all said and done. My first ever office was in South Central. What I'm saying with that is like, you know, it's important to be present with the people, you know, and kind of like still be able to draw inspiration every day. And my love letter to South Central is just like, I hope that everything that I'm doing while I'm here is something that you guys can truly, truly, truly understand and appreciate that no matter how far I go or how short I go, you know, that I hope that the people in the community understands that I'm truly doing this for, for them. You know, I'm doing it for them, whether it's in a, in a tangible way, in an inspirational way, in a spiritual way. You know, the root of what I, well, how I move every day is based on what started here in South Central. So I just hope that people look at Bricks and Wood as like that love letter. You know, I hope I'm making them proud and I hope that I, I inspire people to, you know, find their way out of they, their, their hole. I would expect anything. The sky is truly the limit for Bricks and Wood and myself. I've definitely been into interior design. With that being said, you know, Bricks and Wood would also be having like furniture pieces around collections and incorporated within, you know, pop-up experiences. And I don't see many black, you know, young black kids from South Central designing furniture. So if I have to be the, the guy at the top of the mountain to tell you it's, it's clear over here to, to be different through furniture or through other design elements, then that's, that's my job. It's celebratory every time uh, to see people wear, you know, bricks and wood on like major publications for, from GQ, Complex, Esquire. You know, I, I can't even name them all at this point, but you know, I, I, I like I enjoy them every single time. I don't I don't take it for granted. So, shout out to uh, all the, the the major press outlets that my mom is familiar with, so that she can know that her son is doing doing pretty well for himself. So.